All right, gang. We are in the chapter, How It Works, chapter five, and we're on page 66. We concluded last week the second full paragraph. So David, I don't know, you wanna recap anything? We got to this point. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just basically wanna um, emphasize where we're at, where, which inventory we're in. We're in the resentment inventory. So three inventories, right? Right. Resentment inventory, fear inventory, and sex conduct inventory. So we haven't got to the other two yet. So resentment, though, Bill's going to really emphasize and reemphasize and really drop the jackhammer on us and how vital this resentment and how it's going to kill us. He uses words like uh, they destroy more alcoholics than anything else. Resentments do that. He uses strong words like fatal infinitely grave and poison all death threats if we keep these resentments we need to be free of these resentments and that's why we have a four column inventory that david will, will post again tonight and uh i think we should just take off from there and get into 66 in the third paragraph okay yeah and we did cover last week and we'll and david just mentioned we've got a little worksheet that we created um some of you guys weren't here last week, no big deal. So we'll just sort of quickly recap when we um, start showing it again as we get into the fourth column. Okay, so page 66, paragraph three. Now well, we're getting into the good stuff. Here we go. We turned back to the list where it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. So First sentence there, we turn back to the list, and then after the comma it says, Ford held the key to the future. That's a promise. I will have a free future if I do this inventory honestly and thoroughly and be get free of these resentments. And turn these resentments into memories. I'm not saying that they're going to be gone, wiped from my memory by any means. They're just memories. They don't own me any longer after I do the work here. And then we're prepared to look at it at it, what? The list from an entirely different angle. So this for me anyways, is me incorporating my sponsor into this thing too a little bit, right? Because when I'm looking at things at a different angle, his perception of things is a, is a whole lot, his lenses are different than mine. That's why I want to put it. His lenses are different than mine. And the way I mean by that is, is, is we go on in that paragraph, he says, we begin to see that the world and his people really dominated us. That is column one mm -hmm. and column two. And in that state, the wrongdoings of others fancied or real so i can't tell the difference between the true or the false a lot of the things that I, I thought happened didn't necessarily happen this is where my sponsor comes in and but they had power to actually kill that is also a death threat and it's also column three because it's the things that affected me in column three and how could we escape we saw that these resentments must be mastered so must in the big book of all called synonyms if you study with howard eber and kathy you will find out that the count is up to about 139 must have tos or had tos in the big book of alcoholics anonymous and then it says we could not wish them away any more than alcohol i do not have any power choice or control when it comes to drink drugs or my resentments so where we are here if everybody flips pack flips back one page to 65 right we got this little chart and uh, again, we'll show our, our worksheet that we use. It's similar layout. It's got three columns. So it's saying we turn back to the list. So the list at this point that we're turning back to is just these first three columns. It's these three pieces of content. Who or what I'm resentful at, the cause, or why I'm resentful at, at that person or thing, and how does it affect me? That's to this point, that's all we've got. These three columns or these pieces of information. We talked about that last time. We'll talk about it again today. So Bill in, in the big book says, 
we were usually as definite as this example, and this is a way to do it. Again, we got our little worksheet, basically the same thing, a little different, right? But, but it doesn't really matter as long as the net result of when I get to this point is I've identified who and what I'm resentful at, the cause and, and how it affects me. How you lay it out in a piece of paper, in a spiral notebook, on a legal pad, in an Excel doc, doesn't matter as long as we accomplish these three things, right? So I'm turning back to this list. Why am I turning back to it? Because it's going to hold, it, it does hold the key to the future. So this is all, for the most part, looking back, this is all this stuff I carried with me. They were so familiar with because I, I was so full, full uh, with uh, anger and resentment and vitriol, right? But now I am prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Okay? And Bill's not being cute here. He doesn't mean upside down or kitty wampus or anything like that. A different perspective from how I look at it. We began to see the world and its people really dominated us. This should be pretty clear because I carried all these people and all these things in the world with me. I let them own me. They dominated me. They were living in my head rent-free. And in this state, to the extent that I allowed it, and I had no control not to allow all these resentments, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. Man, do I love this concept, fancied or real. If you are anything like me, looking back, there are some things I know happen. There's no question. But there are many things I couldn't tell you. Did they happen in real life or did they only happen in my head? Or how about the argument I actually never had with somebody or when, when the showdown came, it was three or five words. But you know how many times I played out that argument in my head over and over and over? That was all fancied. It was just make-believe that was poisoning my brain. Equally as poisonous, right? The wrongdoing of others fancied or real had power to actually kill. How could we escape? Saw these resentments had to be mastered, but how? I'm powerless to do anything about it. I can't wish them away any more than alcohol. I can't, this is, resentments are going to kill me. We covered this um, last week, you know, it's four times on this page. And there was a fifth time back on 64 where Bill is saying five different ways resentments kill us. He talks about Grave, right? Infinitely grave, fatal, poison, uses five different, destroys more alcoholics than anything else. He doesn't say alcohol destroys more alcoholics than anything else. He says resentments, right? All forms of my spiritual disease come out of resentment. But I am powerless to do anything about it. I got to get to this power that's going to help me out. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. I don't have anything on this paragraph, but while you were reading, I looked up fancied and it, mm. from the previous paragraph, and it's yeah. believe without being certain or based on imagination. Based on imagination. Perfect. Thank you, Abby. So that paragraph 66, fourth paragraph, bottom of the page, this was our course. So these, this is a direction. We realized that people, column one, who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms, column one and two, and the way they disturbed, disturbed us, column three, they, like ourselves, were sick too. This is a very important part for me. I need to understand that, too, because next thing I'm going to come into is a prayer. Anytime in the Big Book of All Cogs Anonymous, it says, we ask, we're talking about a prayer there. And here's the important part of that is it says, we ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience 
that we, we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. So if I had a sick friend with cancer or some other disease and I would be, you know, compassionate, loving, caring, thoughtful. Same for spiritually sick people. I did not grow up in the best childhood. Some of us had worse. Some of us had different. Doesn't matter. That's not what shapes me as an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because once I put alcohol in my body, something abnormal happens to me. And once I stop, I cannot stay stopped. And I suffer from the spiritual malady. And that's what we're talking about here. This malady that, that runs me and destroys me, sets me back to the obsession without my permission, without my consent. I pick up another drink and then I'm off to the races again because once I put it in my body, I cannot control the amount. I, I cannot manage the amount I put in there. So the prayer for me is, is simple. It says, we ask God to help us show them the same powers, pity, and patience that you would have cheerfully grant a sick friend. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I have a family member who is a very spiritually sick person who did a lot of terrible things to me in my life. I say this prayer because I have to help him. He's in his 90s now. God tapped me on the shoulder. I was paying attention. I'm not asleep dreaming I'm awake any longer. It was that evident to me that I needed to be a part of his life. And I need to pray that prayer so that I treat him with the same love and tolerance as I would a sick man. Because if I took his inventory, he would not be deserving of this for me. Not my job to judge that sick person. My job is to pray for me, ask God to help us. This is the sick man's prayer. That is for me, not for them. And then it says, when a person offended, uh, next, par next part of the paragraph there, it says, when a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man like myself how can i be helpful to him <laughs> for me today in a recovery this is second nature today i'm not saying i don't question it at first but when i feel the presence of god in my life and i feel it often and always because i'm connected to this power i have it available to me all day long i do this work i do a 10 step throughout the day the clock doesn't stop on 10 i do an evening review i do upon awakening in the morning i try to practice these principles in all my affairs the best ability that i can i work intensively with other alcoholics so that i don't have this malady in my life so i don't live in the bedevilments any longer that i'm not full of selfishness and self-centeredness so that when this shows up in my life where i need to be of service to others doesn't mean necessarily alcoholics and drug addicts means that I have to be of service to others, maximum service to God and all his kids. How can I, how can I be helpful to him? I always like the word be. What would you have me be, God? Now what would you have me do? See, my I had a sponsor one time, a number 24 hours ago, he says, you'd like to fix it, God. You think that you can go fix everything and everybody. And you can't. Why don't you start saying, God, what would you have me be? And when I started doing that, I understand. I started understanding the big book a little bit more because that's what they're talking about here. Yes, this is a program of action. There's no doubt about it. But I have to have a thought before I perform an action. And the action here is to get to prayer. It says, God save me from being angry. This is a suggested anger prayer. This is asking me, not getting angry, but save me from being angry. <laughs> There's a difference there. Save me from being angry. There was a situation the other day when I'm helping this 90-some-year-old man, and it just irritated me immediately. And I had to call God in because <laughs> now I have to do something with him. David knows what it is. Well, I'll tell you what it is. So we're leaving the VA hospital. He got his brand-new walker. He's walking outside, and he took him to the bathroom prior to, uh, to the, his appointment there. And we're walking outside, and he goes, I can walk all the way to your truck. So he's walking in his truck with a brand new uh, walker and his pants fall down around his ankles. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. This is the selfish self center me. Now I got to touch this guy. I got to pull up his pants. I got to tuck in his shirt. I got to zip up the thing. got to bump in the belt. And it's like, and, and these thoughts are rushing through my brain. And I said, you know what? God, what would you have me be? Well, you would have me be pull up his pants, buckle his pants, zip it up, tuck in his shirt and be that guy. And I did that with the love and the tolerance that I was given by a God. You know, it's just a memory at this point right now. How did that harm me? See, I'm selfish and self-centered by nature, and I have to be rid of this, the selfishness and self-centered. This, through prayer, allows me to get out of self. When I invite God in, there's no, not enough room for me. There's plenty of room for God. Because where is God? He's closer than my breath. I like how David said, though, he had to call God in. It's like calling him up off the bench, right? So when, <laughs> as David's walking out, and I know because I know all the background and all the stories because David calls me and tells me them. 
maybe there's a little will and then right we get to this moment and like out of control so then finally realize oh wait a minute i'm not supposed to be running the show here sorry i will sit back down at the end of the bench god i forgot you're the coach and the starting point guard right so so this was our course this was our course not this is a suggested course this is our course our singular course look at pay attention to the writing we realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick, uh, perhaps uh, Bill's probably being generous here. We don't know, but really what Bill is doing here is giving us a perspective, a paradigm, a way of thinking, a construct, a new right, way to approach life. He's, he, Bill is talking about we are continuing to adopt and embrace a – uh, profound alteration in our reaction to life, right? So we didn't like their symptoms, you know, and how those symptoms or the people or, or, or the institutions or principles disturbed us. The people, we'll just talk about that. They like ourselves, we're sick too. So many of us are sick and this isn't the first time, guys, right? I believe it's in at the very beginning of the book and we don't have to go there, right? But in, in the, I think in the fourth or the first edition, Bill talks about, this way of life has benefits for everybody, right? Most of us are trouble. Yeah, I, have I met some amazingly spiritually balanced people and whether they got their spirituality th through faith or some other system? I have, and I am always so en envious because I'm like, man, well, how is it that you are so together? How hard did you have to work? And, and some people are just sort of smooth and even keeled and have got this sense, right? But many of us, beyond those of us in recovery, they're ill too. This is the perspective. We're all sick children of God, right? And so because of this, I need to ask God to help me show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that I'd cheerfully grant a sick friend. If I had a buddy who was like a terrible alcoholic and cocaine addict, and every time I saw him, he, uh, he punched me in the gut and stole my wallet so he could go cop some more alcohol and coke, I'd probably be pretty angry at him, right? What if that same buddy had like a brain tumor, something on his frontal lobe, screwed up his judgment, and he did this to me? I'd probably be angry. And then once I understood what was motivating, not motivating, causing this, I bet I would uh, feel very differently, right? And this is talked about many times in our literature as well. The outside world, how we all want them to understand us because, oh, everybody, please understand me and pity me. Don't you know I'm truly a sick man? People think there's something wrong with us morally because we're alcoholics and addicts, right? But we're spiritually ill. We've got a real illness, no different than any other life-threatening one like cancer in our frontal lobe, right? When a person offended us, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. Don't you think David, who's taking time off work and dealing with this guy from his life that he had a lot of tr difficulty with from his childhood, don't you think David has other things he would rather do? Don't you think David had a moment of anger when the guy's pants dropped around his ankle in the parking lot? but what's the opportunity here? What are you going to lash out at the old 90 year old guy and say, this is from my childhood. Pull your own pants up, get to the car. Everybody can act that way or pause and ask God to redirect. And by the way, in a stressful, high emotion situation like that, when pause happens, am I pausing or is God pausing me? It's always my question. Go ahead, David. Let me be clear here, too. This is not of me, okay? This is through mm. me. Mm. You need to know that. This is not of me. And here's why I know it's not of me. Because as the pants come down, he says, uh-oh. And I look and I go, what? And then I look down I see pants around his ankle. Right behind him is a squad car pulling through the parking lot, <laughs> patrolling the parking lot. And I... So God sh showed up with a police officer, so I couldn't act out. Maybe I would have done what David said. Maybe I would have gone, hey, what the F are you doing? And like, why could and I didn't because I always think everybody's watching me. Mm. 
I'm not, I don't think too little of myself, too much of myself. It's all I do is think of myself. But in the moment, I needed to ask God to come in. And again, not, not off the bench, but that's my problem, is I don't do it often enough. As often as I do it, it's still not enough. But we'll have plenty of directions in the book and, and how to do it, when to do it, and, and always be connected to it. We can always be connected to, to power here. So um, this is a sick man. And I got to remember, I'm a sick man, too, in untreated alcoholism, irritable, restless, and discontent, full of selfishness, mm -hmm. self-centered, and fear, dishonest, and, and de delusion. I mean, Bill, this fourth step, please understand, it, it, David says this all the time, it's a celebration. It is not a beatdown. It's for me to be able to see the truth about myself that I can stop living the lie. You know, because when we get to fourth column, we're going to get to it in the next two paragraphs here. Bill's going to tell us we're going to see the truth. We're not going to see a part. There's no part here. It's about wrong or harm done. Because if you have a part, then I have a part. And I'm going to look at your part. I'm not going to look at mine. Hmm. But if I look at my wrongs or my harms done, then I can start seeing the truth. And when I start seeing the truth, and the fifth step, we're really going to see this too, is where hmm. there is truth, there is God. I need to, I understand that today because I've seen the fifth step promises immediately come true for me. And every time I sit down with any of my protégés, they have a fifth step promise experience. I have an, another one myself. Let's just be clear before we move on. This is our course, our singular course. I do not get to say, well, I'm going to treat uh, Abby, Ashton, Rob, and Patrick uh, like they're sick uh, people. Uh, but uh, Andy, Esteban, and Carol, to hell with them, right? I don't get to pick and choose and decide, well, he's really being a jerk. Or my wife, if she would only da-da-da, or my boss, all these examples, right? No, no, this is a blanket perspective. If someone harms me, they're probably spiritually sick, period. And all of this is really summed up. I know we're studying the big book here, but page 90 in the 12 and 12, it might be my favorite single line in any of the AA literature. It is a spiritual axiom that anytime we are disturbed, there is something wrong with us. I own everything that way. I exclusively look in the mirror. If I'm disturbed, that's my fault. Continuing on page 67. Paragraph, full paragraph number one. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. So it says, we avoid retaliation and argument. So if we go back to the paragraph prior, in the middle of the paragraph where it says a person, when a person offended. So remember, the word offended means resentful or annoyed, typically as a result of a perceived insult, a harm done, right? So we avoid retaliation and argument because of the warning in the prior paragraph. As we connect the dots here. We wouldn't treat a sick, pe sick people that way. David and I have a very, very close friend of ours who came in. We all came in around the same time, and he's a very ill guy. Mm. I won't go into what, it, what it's all about because I can't even explain it well. But we treat him with love and care and tolerance like a brother, man. I mean, always. Always in our thoughts and always in our prayers. Always. And we were, we, used, we used to go out to dinner with him. We got to get back into the habit of doing that yeah. more often. But the, the bottom line is, why? And, and David's point is so, so good. Why do I treat some people this way? Because they have something that I want. Hmm. and the ones that don't i treat differently well i'm a salesperson i've been a salesperson for 40 plus years i have learned a long time ago to treat people the way you want to be treated that means everybody and i need to bring god into that thing all the time and i'm a happy joyous and free guy because of the steps of alcoholics anonymous in a relationship with power today and i bring that to every relationship i get to go to today because these steps flat out work they just do they work i don't i can't explain to you necessarily how they work for the individual, but they do as, uh, as uh, the we, because I don't do any of this stuff alone. But then it says uh, in that paragraph, it says we wouldn't treat a sick uh, people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. What is my goal to be? I am supposed to be helpful to other people. That's my goal, always. 
You know, I have five daughters, as you most of you guys know here, and they're all adults. And when they have, want help, I give them help. But I, I'm really clear that they need to ask me for that help because I will stick my toe in and get in the way and I, I will trip myself up because I'm trying to insert myself into this relationship and try to fix, manage, and control. But they're well aware that when they need my help, I will be there for them. But it's not to fix, manage, and control. And then it says, uh, we cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. This is, again, we're really, Bill is really laying it on here. I'm without power, choice, and control. The question is, do I need God? Do I need Alcoholics Anonymous? And the answer is yes and yes. I desperately need God. I desperately need Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm my own power. I'm my own devices. I am going to either behind the resentment, behind the fear, behind the sex conduct, behind selfishness, self-centeredness, self-pity, dishonest, uh, delusionment, and all these things is a drink. That's why the steps are designed in a way that they ask a question and they're answered in the next, in the next step. And they bring me to a relationship with power. And throughout the day, I can walk around not segmenting my life in different ways. This is who I am most of the time. I know I got to tone it down once in a while at home. But the thing is, is like I'm inspired by a power greater than myself. Why wouldn't we be happy about that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> the thing that God is doing for me, what I can't do for myself, to bring all this happy, joyous, and freedom to my life, bring that into other people's relationship. Especially the protege, especially the person who's doing a four-step. As they made their appointment with themselves to sit down and make this this uh, four step, and I, I use the word appointment, just like I think I need to make an appointment with myself when I do a four step. The reason why that is, and same with the fifth step, it's just like going to the doctor's office. I make an appointment with the doctor. I just don't get to walk into the doctor's office. I make an appointment so that for the consultation that's going to take place. The same thing is with me with the four step. I'm making an appointment with myself. I'm letting my sponsor know when I started. One of my proteges is here tonight, <laughs> Ashton, and she she started her resentment list today. And I appreciate that because she made, Ashton made an appointment with herself. Now we can get on and do this work. Now we can see the truth. Now we can get free of four step four through nine. So I know myself a little bit better. I can see the truth about myself. And then I can live in the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 and be free of the bondage of self. So I just want to point out a little bit of a shift that happened here too, and a, a way to think about it. So back on the bottom of 66, where we started tonight, it was the paragraph about turning back to the list. And Bill is introducing this concept that we're going to look at it differently. Basically, we're going to, we're going to start to look at, we are going to be accountable for all of these resentments. Right? But then the next two paragraphs, right? So this was our course. And then the, we avoid retaliation or argument. Remember, what we've been reading here in the book is about constructing this fourth step inventory. But these last two paragraphs are really more direction about as I continue to go through life, right? Now you could say, okay, well, as I'm writing the inventory, I want to make sure I'm not retaliating or arguing. I mean, maybe you could look at it that way, but we haven't even gotten into the fourth column yet, right? My interpretation of the point of these is it's a, it's sort of a sneak preview and it's relevant content once we get later into the 10th step, because ultimately in the 10th step, I am constantly going back and reworking uh, four through nine, right? And so I need to carry this paradigm forward from this point in my recovery and have no lapses in it. This is giving me direction as about how I am to go through life, right? I avoid retaliation argument. I wouldn't treat a sick person that way. In my example, Right, somebody who's who is uh, got a brain tumor, right? And every time I, I see, what did I say? They would, they punch me in the gut and steal my wallet. I would probably feel pretty sad for the person. I might probably be angry each time they hit me, but I bet I'd be over it quickly because I know they were sick. But here's also the deal: if I am going through life and someone is mistreating me, right, I can also get out of that. Right. I don't have to subject myself to matters that can hurt me security wise. Right. And, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is someone had passed something in, in the chat. It's probably sort of better dealt with with a sponsor, but it's about the nature of what do I do when I'm involved with someone and it's. Um, 
not going well. A lot of bad stuff coming my way, right? So I'm just going to, I'm not going to turn into amateur psychologist here or, or, or sponsor someone I'm not sponsoring, but I just, number one, anytime I'm disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with me, right? And number two, I don't crawl before anybody. And really number three, it is my responsibility to be with God and take care of myself. Okay. I got to surround myself with healthy people. Um, before we get into the next paragraph here, let's do this. Let's just bring our worksheet back up. So let me, uh, one sec here, guys. Here. Okay. So for anyone who wasn't here last week, this is, um, this is a work a set of worksheets. This is the resentments we're talking about, but also in here is fears and uh, sex harm, sex conduct. If you would like copies of these, there's a PDF version and there's an Excel version at purposeofthisbook.com at the very bottom. Rob, if you don't mind, just put that in the chat again real quick. Um, this was inspired by um, a version that we uh, got from Joe and Charlie. Um, and uh, we, those two guys are our heroes, but we thought it was even too sophisticated for dumb guys like David and I. So we slimmed it even down because Joe and Charlie took it to the next level and wove in concepts for the 12 and 12. And we're like, man, we're not, we're not bright enough for that. So we just created this, this uh, worksheet. It's another way of putting the content down, just like the little chart on 65. Not saying it's right. It's just a way that, that we have been doing it that follows the language in the book pretty closely. So there's the, I am, I am resentful at column, same as on 65. The cause column, same as on 65, all the effects, my options uh, on 65 as well. And I'm just going to leave this up here for this fourth column as we uh, start to read this. Okay. And, and, and um, again, if you want to download it, purposeofthisbook.com, it's at the very bottom. It's just a one page website. You can't miss it. It says four step inventory. Okay. So actually, maybe I'll pop it down and then I'll just pop it back up in a sec here, David, once we. After I do the reading, mm -hmm. if I can find the stop share button, there it <laughs> is. Okay. So 67, second paragraph. Referring to our list again. So going back to the first three columns we wrote. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done. We resolutely look for our own mistakes. David just talked about this. Not my part, their part. What are my mistakes? Where had we been? Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. Though a situation that had not been entirely our fault, this is maybe where people got the part from, I don't know, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. Abby, you got anything? Yes, I do. I have resolutely, um, which is having a decided purpose without doubt. Um, so putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we without doubt looked for our own mistakes. And then I looked up self-seeking, um, which is one who seeks only or unduly his own interest or pleasure. Thank you. Let me jump in here if you don't mind, David. Um, Please. such a great paragraph. It, it's a, the instructions for how we are to do this whole recovery thing to work the 12 steps. They're all in here. The first time I did a four step, my, my sponsor had, had, uh, given me, I think he gave me like a Hazelden guide or something. And then I was a part of this men's group and they had this printout of another way to do it. And everyone talked to her, oh, I'll do it this way, this way, this way. And I was losing my mind because everybody had a, a different way to approach this. And at some point, thank God, about a month in, and I, I can't, I, this I cannot remember. In my ego, the story I tell myself is I read the book again, and it was clear to me. 
I'm sure that's not what happened. I'm sure somebody said, hey, man, it's right here. Just do this. This is so simple. Referring to the list again, so I'll go back to the piece of the many pieces of paper I had with those third, first three columns, which are pretty easy because I carried that stuff close to me for, for 30 years. I look for my own mistakes. Where had I been selfish? Four options here. That's it. I've been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. And if you were like me or anything remotely like me, you had or will put down selfishness or, or self-seeking on 99% on of the rows. This is the root of my problems, right? Selfishness, self-seeking, self-centeredness, self-pity, you know, self-sabotage, self, 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 right? And then beyond the selfishness and the self-seeking, the dishonesty, straight up lies or, or admitting the truth, and of course, fear, right? And then we do have a separate fear inventory, right? We're going to get into that one next. But when David and I were redesigning this, it's like, I really wanted to put that fright and call. And let me just, I guess, show this again, because I'm referring to it. Sorry, guys. Trying to be efficient here. Really wanted to put that fright and call them in for a couple of reasons. One, to be true to the book, right? It's given me these four options. And the other thing is, that's a nice springboard then to get into the fear inventory. Because I'm going to have a bunch of rows on here that I've already marked made me frightened. Right? And when I was frightened, those things are related to fears. They're going to go right to the fear inventory. One can lead right into the next. And though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we try. So again, this is at the beginning. I'm still wrapping this new perspective, this, this, this new way of thinking, you know, around and through my head. And so it's very hard for me to just say, okay, I'm going to own everything. So I say, well, yeah, okay. I mean, you know, Rob was kind of an asshole about this, but I guess I could see, you know, maybe I was too. So even if I'm sitting in this, right, and I'm sitting in this, well, maybe I got a part and he's got a part. The direction is we tried to, and we know what Yoda says about try, right? Do or do not, there is no try. So I'm just going to say we disregarded the other person involved entirely. What you did not relevant. Where was I to blame? Inventory is mine. It's not yours. When I see my faults, I list them. So it talks about mistakes, right? A couple sentences it up. We resolutely look for mistakes. And here it says, um, when we saw our faults. So in our little worksheet here, we got check boxes for selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. And then my mistakes and faults. This is the where. This is the what. Be specific. Again, don't need to write a novel. Same thing we talked about earlier. Don't need more than it was 19 or 20 words, whatever the example was on the chart on 65. Same thing. Cap it, guys. I do not need the whole backstory. I don't need the history. I'm sure I said it last time as, as I'm taking going through this with a sponsee or a protege, as David's been saying. If they start by saying, well, so here's what happened. I'm like, dude, stop. <laughs> I, I, do, I, don't, I don't need the backstory. I don't need to, all the links in the chain. What did I do wrong? Period. I stole from this person. I punched that person. I was insanely jealous of my girlfriend. You know, I acted out. I thought I did. I did. I did. Right. What did I do? Placed it before me in black and white. Write it down. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and we're willing to set these matters straight. So guys, you can see it. We're already pre-connecting the dots to the rest of the steps. And this is the beautiful part of it. I think there's been a misconception for many years too. I had this misconception that I had to start all over when I get to my eighth step. When we get to the eighth step, there's like two paragraphs of content. It says, you already wrote an inventory. Flesh it out and get into making some amends. So this is, Bill does, a, the more I study, the more I see that Bill plants these seeds and drops these little mini bombs early, they're going to have great significance later. You know, one we go back to all the time is page 20, right? Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers, it's our constant thought of others and how we may meet their needs. He's telling us my life is going to be based on service. Right? And right here he says, I got to admit my wrongs. I got to identify mistakes and faults and start to wrap my head around some willingness to set these matters straight. 
when I get there. Bye, David. Okay, so Bill doesn't use, uh, I may get uh, corrected by the end of the meeting too, and Howard, you're welcome to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when we go back to 65, we see that there's three columns in the illustration right there, right? Three columns. Bill doesn't call them columns. We, he refers to on page 66 as the list. On page 67, he says referring to the list again, but there's no fourth column. And the, maybe the reason for the four, no fourth column was it was kind of expensive to put in their fourth column. But the directions for the fourth column are right here on page 67 in the second paragraph. So we don't necessarily need the illustration because here's the directions right here. Referring to our list again, we put out of the minds the wrongs others had done. That's columns two and three. We're very familiar with them. I lived in one, two, and three my entire life. We resolutely looked at for our own mistakes, column four, where we've been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. Selfish, thinking about myself. That's selfish. Self-seeking is about my behavior, which stems from my selfishness. Dishonest. How am I representing myself? Very dishonest person. Ba David said it. Th these are all in my fourth column, everyone for every, every uh, relationship. And frightened. How am I trying to protect myself? Frightened. So the example for all that thing is, is like, and if I say it's my wife. And I'm resentful at her because uh, I'm uh, I'm so I'm selfish because she got mad. I didn't come home Friday night and I can't I didn't bring my paycheck home. And uh, I'm mad about that because I'm selfish because I wanted her just to be understanding because I needed a night out with the boys. Pretty selfish, right? Well, I'm dishonest because I want her to tell me it's OK to do that from time to time. That's very dishonest. What am I self-seeking? I want her to be fill in the blank. And then where am I frightened? I'm frightened because now I feel like she could leave me. So I can fill in the blank anywhere you want. But David's point is, is so important for me. The history of this thing is irrelevant because the problem with the history of you give me more backstory, I just want to know, you know, where were you selfish, dishonest, uh, self-seeking and frightened. And I want you to read on the page, whatever you wrote on the page. That's all I want to see. I don't want a backstory. Why? Because you are now a victim. You will make yourself a victim. And where there's a victim, you're a liar. That's what I am. I'm a liar. When I become a victim, I'm a liar. Where, there's, where I'm a victim, that empowers me, which is selfish, so dishonest, and self-seeking. So then it says, so our situation had, been entirely, had not been entirely our fault. We tried to disregard the other person involuntarily. So let's forget about column two and three for a minute. Put it aside. Mm. Let's mm. not even look at it. Why? Right. We know who harmed us, right? And let's look at four. So forget about two and three at this moment. It says, where were we to blame? Blame. Where were mm. we to blame? Okay, very, there's a question. Bill puts a question there. The inventory was ours, not the other person's. I need to be responsible here. When we saw our faults, we listed them. What are our faults? My defects of character. I'm going to have plenty to take the God in seven. Trust me. We placed them before us in black and white, as David pointed out. So now we're really certain that this is a written inventory. We admit our, we admit our wrongs honestly and we're willing to set them, these matters straight. And as David pointed out, these are the dots that are connected to the eight step. That way I'm going to have this. I'm going to be willing to make this list. I'm going to go out to my fellows and uh, clear up the wreckage of my past. So here we are. I'm going to see column one, column two, and column three are all lies. Column four is the truth. Mm. So as we look at the totality of now, and again, you got Bill's example in the book, and David said, you know, and maybe Howard does have a nugget. Why didn't Bill have a fourth column here? Maybe they couldn't afford it, right, like David said, or typesetting, it wasn't going to fit. Maybe the font would have been too small. Whatever the case is, the most important part, what we're coming out of here is the fourth column or the, hey, we don't even want to talk about columns. It's the my mistakes and faults section. And again, you don't want to do columns. You want to do it paragraph, short paragraph form where it's resentful at the top and then the cause and then affects my and then mistakes, whatever, as long as we get to this content. And David already mentioned this and he's heard me say it a million times. The fourth step, especially the resentment inventory, 
is a freaking celebration. I understand that anytime I'm disturbed and what the, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with me. I'm, I understand that, but few things make me angrier in an AA meeting when a new person brings up that they're working on a four step and a bunch of crusty asshole old timers who never worked these steps are like, oh man, four step, you better finish it so you don't drink a fifth. And man, like, shut up. I want to throw those guys out a window. People are trying to save their lives. Why would we say anything to scare them about continuing the work? This is a celebration. This is where I learn who I've been and who I'm not going to be because of the promises that were uh, previewed to me on page 27. How my head, my heart, and my gut are going to get healthy. Those old thoughts and feelings and attitudes are going to get cast aside, replaced by new ones. I don't have to create a whole new in my case, 40 pages typed, single spaced inventory filled with my mistakes and faults. I've not had to do that since. I've done some many four steps. I'm probably due for another one. Right? Why not? But I, I'm not that guy anymore. It's a celebration. You're not that guy or gal or person anymore either once you go through this. Right? Uh, I tasked Abby with a couple of her definitions. Did you get into those, Abby? You still look, okay, no problem. Um, here was the other thing that I wanted to say. Um, sorry, it goes back to, forgive me, guys. I, I, oh, um, when we go back on 64, when the four-step inventory uh, was introduced, it talks about, um, it's drawing the analogy to a commercial inventory, right? Where you go into your warehouse and you see what's in the slots and the bins, how many you got, what's the shape it's in. And it says back on 64, paragraph one, taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. So now we're coming all the way full circle now that we've got these fourth columns, right? The fact-finding could be argued are columns one, two, and three. And perhaps the fact-facing is the reality of my mistakes and, and faults in that fourth column, right? Typically, when Bill uses these analogies, he almost always pays them off pretty, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ab. Okay, so I have selfish, which is taking care of one's own comfort advantage without regard for interests of others. Mm. Dishonest is marked by fraud, lacking honesty, not trustworthy. Um, self-seeking again is one who seeks only his own interest or pleasure and then frightened is alarmed or afraid anything else at this point on this david no we'll uh definitely need some in uh in the fears of a corroding shot evil that need a uh abby if you would come out of the 1938 dictionary please Anything else on that paragraph you want to move into? Yeah, we get 10 minutes. We can start the fear. You yeah, that? we can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please. we can always double back next week as yep. we are wont we to do. Okay. So okay. this is the resentment inventory. The first of the three inventories in the fourth step. We're now going to talk about the second, which is the fear inventory. And I like this one because, uh, I don't know, for my money, it's even easier. And I like easier, softer. All right. Bottom of 67. You know, I, I guess I should say one thing. Um, I either sort of uh, specifically or implicitly stated that as an alcoholic and addict like me, that collectively resentments are the most important inventory for everybody. And it, for me, it was. But that was my personal story. I was so filled with resentments. All three are important, but we're all a little bit sick in different ways. I have sponsored people where their fear inventory was the most powerful inventory for them. And I have certainly uh, sponsored a number of people where their sex conduct, their sex harms was the most powerful inventory for them. All important. I got to do it all. But each one has a, a different sense of, um, I don't know, criticality 
to the person writing the inventories. And the only reason I'm saying that is um, I was just thinking about some of the language I was using and I didn't want anyone to take me the wrong way to suggest that globally the resentment inventory is more important or has greater weight than the other two. Bottom is 67. Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. So just let's just pause real quick. Quick look back at 65. Everybody see on the effects of my column, you see fear, 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 fear five times, five times in parentheses, they're bracketed. Right? That's what he's talking about. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did not we, ourselves, set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. Hold on. I think okay. Abby, Abby's got some stuff. I have corroding um which is to eat away or be eaten away to wear away gradually so in this sentence it was an evil and uh, eaten away thread the fabric do fabric of our existence was shot through with it go ahead david Dude. okay yeah. and then um so David pointed out, page 65, the fears are bracketed. We had discussion after the meeting with Howard last week, three kind of fears here. Fear of losing something that I, I want. Fear of not getting something that I want, I'm sorry. Fear of losing something that I have. Or fear of being found out. Mm. So these are three three fears, but let's read on this. Because the short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. Bill is a wizard here, man. He's using the word shot. If you get shot, it permeates you. Like Ashton's a uh, ICU nurse. My daughter is a uh, ER nurse. They get shot. It doesn't usually just stay in one spot. It spreads. It permeates throughout. That's what fear does. It spreads throughout me. And uh, it, corroding is the word that uh, Abby gave us as a definition, a fabric of our existence. It sets in motion, trains the circumstances, brought, brought us misfortune. We felt we didn't deserve. Mm. See, Bill's really painting a picture here with, with simple words like shot and corroding and how we feel like we, we don't deserve this thing. But did we, did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? That is a question I'm going to answer here. It says sometimes we think fear ought to be classed, classed with stealing. It seems it causes more trouble. So I don't know. I've heard it explained a couple of different ways. You know, stealing, that, I mean, to me, that's a uh, conscious decision, right? Steal something at the store, steal something from somebody else. Conscious Is stealing, is fear a conscious decision? I don't know about that. But if I'm consumed with fear, how can I help anyone else? Then I'm stealing from you. I am not able to be in your life when I'm stealing from you. When the fear, when the consume with fear. So there's different kinds of fears, right? Rational fears and irrational fears, like fear of uh, burning building. Get the heck out now, you know, fear of heights, stuff like that. How about um, fear of, uh, I, when I did my, um, I remember when I, I sat down for my first four step, my first sponsor, he says, so what fears do you have? And I said, I ain't got any fears. Tough guy, right? Yeah. Macho. <laughs> Dude, what I found out, I'm afraid of everything. <laughs> I'm afraid of everything when I got honest with myself here. And it says, so one of the things I put down on my list was I was afraid I was going to drink again. Mm. Well, how can I prevent that on my own power? Should I have my Gorski handbook of relapse prevention with me everywhere I go? Or how about my trigger list <laughs> or whatever I need? No, that's the stuff I got out of treatment. That's not going to help me here. Self-reliance is the reason why I don't do well with fear because it's not strong enough. We're going to find out about that in the next paragraph. 
but living life on life's terms. That gets me thirsty too, guys. I'm living life on God's terms today. But the fears that we're talking about here, how about losing my family? That was something I was fearful of. But then I got to look at the opposite sides of that. And David uses really good examples when we we're in the treatment center. Fear of getting a job, you know, fear of moving up in the ranks and getting promoted at work. Now my fear is that they're going to expect more out of me. <laughs> you know, it's like if I take this promotion, fear gets me coming and going all the time. But I got to look at what the opposites are. What if, if I do stay sober, will I get what Esteban has? Will I get what Carol has? Well, my book says yes, it will. If I do it honestly and thoroughly as they did. So those fears will be God-reliance instead of self-reliance because self-reliance just doesn't go far enough here. So, um, I don't know. That's where I want to end it, I guess, on that. Okay. I'll just really add a little... quick, if I can. Oh, please, Sorry. please, Abby. Yeah, no, go um, David asked me to look up shot through, and I couldn't find anything good in the 1938 dictionary or the Big Book dictionary, but I looked it up, and it says, to show or contain a particular emotion or quality in a noticeable way all the way through. Mm. So when talking about it, it was an evil and corroding thread, the fabric of our existence was noticeable all the way through with it. Thanks, Abby. So then, did you look up just the word shot or did you try to connect it? I looked up shot through. Okay. All right. Okay. Because I thought I got that permeated spread throughout with something I took out of that 38 dictionary a while back. But okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit and we'll, 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 uh, we'll circle back to this. Um, just a, a couple of quick um, concepts on this. So it set in motion. So fear set in motion. Trains of circumstances, so things that resulted, things that happened, which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But here's the real connective tissue. Did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? I had a position of fear because of some limitation or restriction, some prejudice that I had put in place that allowed me to be feared. You know, David brought up, I, I talk about this a lot about being full of fear and the bedevilments. Like I said, they could offer me the promotion at work because I'm, I'm actually showing up and doing a good job. And I'm totally afraid of taking the promotion because they're going to expect even more. But then there's always an offsetting fear right? What if I don't take the job? Then I'm never going to make any money. I'm never going to have a real career. I'm never going to be able to provide for my family, right? Fear, fear, fear. This is why we're full of fear. We only think in fear outcomes, right? And maybe we'll talk a little bit more, some more examples next week. But then this, this, this last sentence too, uh, second last, sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. One of the ways I like to think about this, and I, and I know I heard it from a speaker one time, when I am in fear, I'm in the future. I'm not thinking about what's happening to me in the moment. I'm thinking about what's going to happen to me. Someone's pointing a gun at me. I'm not afraid the gun is pointing at me. I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the future when somebody pulls the trigger, right? My wife and I are in an argument. I'm not afraid that we're having an argument. I'm afraid of the future and she's going to leave me, right? It's all about the future. And when I am constantly in the future, I am stealing from myself in the moment. I'm denying myself being present today in my life and in all of your lives. Right? And that's not classifying it with stealing. It's more of an example to say what it's like to be stealing from ourselves when we are full of fear. And we'll stop there.